All right, well, um, thanks for returning from the break here. And um, our next speaker is, uh, is uh, Mike McCormick. And uh, he is from Dan Law. Dan Law is a partner of ours. We've been working on some, some different integrations with them, um, some of them still in the works. And uh, Mike is part of their uh, testing, in, or I'm sorry, the product development team. And he's going to talk to you about uh, testing for embedded software. So, uh, Mike, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, Mike McCormick then uh, from Danlaw, and uh, today then uh, I'm going to be focusing more on um, uh, how we'd take an organization that wasn't uh, doing Agile, um, demonstrate the need for Agile, and demonstrate the need for automa automation, and then show you how automation for test would be um, implemented and some of the concerns or issues that you might run into um, if, uh, when you start looking at uh, automated test in an agile environment. So Danlo, uh, based here um, in Novi, in fact, with offices uh, and uh, employees in China and India, um, three main pillars to the company, just a quick introduction. We're in the engineering services pillar, which does uh, consulting services, managed services, very involved in testing in automotive embedded systems. And then um, we have a, a few products, the one I'll be introducing slightly today is this MX Suite product, which is um, a good complement to the Polarian uh, uh, tools. And uh, between the two tools, we can get very close to full automation of embedded systems testing. So the case for ALM and automation, uh, step one, how we go about implementing automated tests. And then I pulled out some bullets, which uh, hopefully are some useful pointers or things to watch for as, as you implement automated tests. And, um, um, you know, considerations which aren't immediately apparent, but uh, once you start getting there, you know, or, or when you start planning how you would roll this out, you'll see that uh, 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 how those you know, pitfalls to be avoided and uh, you know, ways you can shortcut maybe um, the rollout of this in your organization. So the case for ALM, so I've got a, a quick uh, uh, animation here just to go through. We have a product, say your company has a product, and there it is on the left-hand side, and and that's what we have and what the customer wants is one of these so obviously it's not going to fit um, but we're going to take an agile approach and we're going to iterate uh, a few times and you know we get closer and closer as we iterate and uh, finally we can see we might get have what's needed now there's a few attributes attributes of what the customer is looking for um, and we not only have to change how it's going to fit but we have to change uh, Another attribute, which is color, if you can see color there as well. So we're doing things concurrently here. Uh, the guys under the line then are, are working to a set of requirements where it's round but changing color. The guys above the line are not changing color, uh, but they're changing shape. And so we can see that from the tester's point of view, they've got uh, different sets of requirements they're working to. So it's another view on the variant question of, you know, do I copy the requirements? Do I have baseline requirements? Or can I, um, in, in my... ALM environment have different sets of requirements which uh, diverge at one point in time and then later on uh, come back together. So we've got iteration going on and we've got concurrency going on which makes it a complex problem and you know with Agile we iterate more and more in smaller steps and uh, you know with large uh, projects we end up with a lot of concurrency to manage. Um, finally we get to what we're, uh, the, the system we're looking for and the way we do it in Agile is with sprints. So We'll just have a quick look at what a sprint is. A sprint is saying taking development artifacts, which include source code, test cases, requirements, um, operating on them, and producing uh, different uh, artifacts, updated source code, uh, updated requirements, updated test cases. And we're going to do that in many places on our, our process here. We're going to do it here, here, here. And here, so we want to be very good at doing sprints. You know, it's something that we're going to be doing a lot of. We're going to have our whole organized development organization working on these sprints, so we've got to be good at it. And so that's something that we want to formalize and optimize as we um, as we move, work on our uh, um, development process. So just to turn that around a bit, then we'll say we've got a repository now, and we put all our artifacts in a repository. So we want. We want to be able to uh, manage those things in some system, and we saw on the slide before that requirements, for example, we can have different version of the requirements, and I just want to focus on that once more, saying, 
not only do we need to manage different versions of source code and test cases, we need different versions of requirements uh, also. So we start applying the process to this, and this is just the simplest way we can really draw the, the process, and every organization is going to have something like this, but it's going to be more complex, I, I really, uh, you know, I imagine. Uh, so we get new requirements in, they queue into our system, and, and some we'll call change control board reviews them and decides whether they're going to be part of the next sprint. Some things will get queued into a sprint, some things will get queued to be happen uh, at a later time. At a later time, we'll rerun the control board, they'll come out of our queue, and maybe that time they'll get put into the sprint. A development organization, which includes test in this case, creates test cases and source code. Uh, at some point then we've got to run our test cases, and we hope this is going to be on a, a frequent basis in an agile environment, you know, daily, maybe uh, hourly. Um, and uh, results are going to come out, and some analysis has to be done on those. So from our point of view now, um, this cycle we saw on the previous slide that we, we iterate and we do things concurrently, so it's something we're doing very often. We've got big teams now all doing parts of these different projects. And even within this uh, cycle, in, inside one sprint, we've got multiple check-ins, we've got iterations and concurrency. So we really have to be able to manage uh, all, all those changes to uh, all those entities and, and you know, the, the um, effort that the, our personnel are putting into those because, um, you know, the, there's so many small things going on, we really need to have a system that's going to, to manage all that data for us. So as I say, we'll be focusing on automation of the run test, but one more kind of backup slide uh, summarizing uh, the complexity of this system is, is this one, and the need for an ALM is to say, well, we've got many artifacts which have to be manipulated, we've got processes, I just brought out the development and test ones there, but we've got to manage versions and iterations, concurrency, relationships between things like what test case tests what requirement, what requirement was for, from what customer feature, different projects, different locations, people, and even then test equipment we need to manage, you know, what resources we've got to execute tests, uh, possibly software, possibly hardware. Um, so it isn't going to work anymore, you know, we've used the Excel spreadsheet for a long time and it just isn't going to work in, in this complex environment anymore. You can't get it all into spreadsheets and manage it all, although people still try. And so we're going to look for an ALM solution that's going to work for us to, to help us manage the data and essentially give us the work to do. And so, uh, you know, the key things now is it's going to manage the data, configurations of different revisions of files, relationships, traceability, and then also manage the effort, which is now, um, you know, the workflow of people, uh, the automation of things like builds and tests and um, you know management of uh, resources, uh, software, human resources, uh, hardware resources. And the piece again that uh, we'll focus on now is uh, test automation. So if, this, if we're going to uh, formalize this process, we want to say, well, what can we pull out? What can we pull out and make automatable so that our... Um, if you like, human resources are minimized and the computer systems do what we uh, know they're good at, which is uh, repeatable uh, tasks that have to be done on a frequent, you know, repetitive cycle. All right, so just back here, one, one slide. We're saying that um, the ALM tool, the Valerian tool, uh, has many capabilities. We saw some of those already before. Um, where the um, Danlaw tool comes in is uh, the capability of executing tests. So, um, and, and really, uh, if we look at this slide here, then we see there's very complementary things now between our offering in the way of a tool and uh, the ALM's uh, solution from Polarian. So, we're involved in test authoring, test presentation, test execution, pass fail analysis, uh, reports. Test harnesses, so that, that there is a, a test <coughs> jig, if you like, for testing hardware. We can test software, we can test models. Um, support for different automotive ideas, support for AutoSAR, support for um, 26262 in our own domain, uh, support for the software development cycle uh, that we know um, the development organizations in, in automotive are familiar with. So lots of things now that we do that are in different domain uh, to the um, to Polarian, but the two together really give us quite a full solution. 
So how we go about implementing automated tests. So this cycle is pretty standard. We'll just go through it. This is what it looks like. So in general, in our development environment, we've got developers. We'll say developers for people developing code, developing models, developing uh, test cases. Um, and they check into some repository uh, where their, their, uh, their work products are stored and, and managed and uh, you know versions are captured and we can go back and see traceability and things. Um, so now the automation cycle starts and it's a kind of brown color there if you can see brown on the screen. So at some point now we're going to say there's some triggers and the triggers are things like someone just did a check-in, um, uh, it's that time of day or that time of week again or maybe it's just a manual trigger to say we need to run these tests because they haven't been run this, this month or something. So we have a trigger that says we're going to uh, initiate a checkout from our repository onto a build server. The build server is going to uh, build an executable entity. It doesn't have to be the final product. It can be um, a smaller software component of it or a, a complete virtual system. It can be a Simulink model, but we end up with something where we can actually execute tests. We deploy the tests to... Uh, sometimes the same computer system, sometimes a different computer system, typically with a, a hardware in the loop test, a HIL for hardware in the loop, it'll be a different system. Sometimes we can run them on the same system if we're just testing software components uh, or, or models. Uh, the, the test tool will execute our test suite of test cases, give us results back, um, and we capture enough information in the test cases to so that we can know whether a requirement is passing or failing. So um, as the results come back, we can actually generate a failure notification and feed that back to the developers. So that can be done in the form of problem reports where we analyze the result, decide it is a problem, um, qualify the problem and put it back in a test in, uh, into, um, to capture it formally in a, a problem tracking system. Or it can also be as quick as a desktop notification to the developer to say, hey, the build didn't work or the test case failed, so they can get right back in the cycle even before um, before a problem report is uh, created and get that thing fixed and have another, have the cycle trigger off again. So certainly um, in, in our environment, builds can take 45 minutes uh, or an hour or so. We could probably speed that up, but uh, that means that uh, we, our build server will be running and creating builds and our test cycles will be starting typically on an hourly basis in our organization. All right, so, so now we want to consider, uh, just back one again, you know, we'll get, we see it says run tests there, and, uh, you know, we've got to consider not every test is automatable. A lot of tests can be automated, but we need to um, understand or uh, define something about how we create and uh, design tests so that we can decide what's automatable, what's not, and we're all talking the same language. So. I put up a lot of terms there just to say it's kind of uh, uh, somewhat random looking saying there's all these phrases people use about defining testing and that's not really going to work if we're going to try and formalize it. So I've got a couple of slides then that uh, uh, are my definitions of some of those words. It doesn't mean they're the only definition, but if we, if we want to formalize it, we'll, we'll agree that my definition's good and, and uh, work with that for a while and we can see we can formalize, uh, formalize how we uh, test. So just a couple of things. I, I highlighted here at the bottom I've highlighted functional sy subsystem test that could be a phrase someone uses and, and we'd say yeah I think I know what he means and someone else might say, might say performance unit test and you know that just kind of what really do those terms mean and if we don't know then we can't uh, we can't make progress in in, uh, in formalizing it and, and automating so so I broke it down looking like this and saying we're going to divide it into four major categories of test, analysis, review, unit test, and system test. And so I'll define those with my definitions, and that just helps us, um, uh, helps us make progress in what's automatable and what's not. A um, couple of things, I put goals at the bottom, so we'll all also talk about the goals. We've got coverage as a goal and automation, and I'll come back to those two, and each of these um, uh, Bubbles then has a, another slide associated with it, but one thing to note here, um, system test and unit test roughly have the same definition, it's just the scope of how big the thing we're testing is. So we can say it's a small thing, we'll call it a subsystem or a unit, and we'll see in the next slide the bigger thing is our full system, our deliverable to our customer. Uh, review is something, in general I'm saying we can't automate, um, 
someone's got to look at it and uh, um, if someone's going to look at it and, and uh, execute tests manually for example in a debugger or just do a code review then that is not easy for computer systems to do right now. Um, analysis is where someone's built a tool which does a, a, a code review uh, in some form and uh, but it leaves something to be desired where we still say there's manual review required. So just a couple more things on this slide. So I'm saying automation can be achieved in analysis block, in the unit test block, in the system test block, and uh, review is something where we have to leave it to the human. Um, you know, as we, as we look at how we're going to test our system, um, we really, or a lot of companies would come up with what we call a, a coverage matrix saying, depending on the safety criticality of the system, we're going to decide which of those blocks is sufficient to do our testing in. So we might be testing primarily at the system level uh, and say we can test virtually everything from the outside of the box so there is no need to go uh, internally. And you know we might say, well, some of these features are safety critical, so we're going to test it on every phase. And we might say some things I can't properly see from the outside of the system, so I'm going to go back into the unit test block and define test cases on a unit. So analysis, um, static analysis, people probably know that tool if they're any, anywhere involved in developing C code. Dynamic analysis, uh, the Polyspace tool is quite well known around deep software development in Detroit. For model testers, there's also analysis tools that look at and apply rules, uh, best practices rules, if you like, to, to the code or the model they're looking at and um, uh, can identify bugs. And often those tests then are done on check-in or even, uh, it comes up on this next uh, bullets here, um, uh, somewhere there, um, that they're done on check-in or, or even as early as um, in the development environment, like in a, a code editor, every time you make an edit, it might actually run some tests on your code and say whether you're staying within the guidelines and rules applied by those tools. The key one there is uh, it's easily automatable, so it may as well be automated. There's no point in uh, leaving those things out. You want to automate it early because it's a, a fast test in general, and uh, if it's going to pull some bugs out, you want those out as uh, fast as possible. The one warning you've got to be careful of there is if you set up the rules too stringent then uh, you spend doing a lot of time in analyzing uh, warnings that are coming from the system with very little payback so uh, that's a you know something that the development and uh, automation team ought to be concerned with so now we'll switch to the other uh, end of our list of four and say system tests well we'll just define it as testing at the IO boundaries of our deliverable you know one man's system is another man's subsystem so if we're developing an ECU and it's uh, a hardware entity we're delivering to a, a, an OEM, then we're testing at our IO boundary. And whereas we might test software interfaces, our customer is really interested in whether it actually works as a system. So we better have some final test that says we can press buttons uh, and, uh, and see the system behave as expected. Um, so as well, then we're in general writing test cases to system requirements, and we ought to be able to write the test cases from the requirements if they're good requirements without actually uh, having access to uh, the system to see how it works. That's a, a better strategy, and I'll come back to that in a second. So some differentiators from unit testing. Um, you know, the, the key thing about iterative development is we keep moving forward and we keep making uh, minimal changes and our risk is that we change some, we, we, something that we tested yesterday or the, or the day before uh, breaks as we added some new feature. So the new feature works and something breaks. So, so the way we mitigate that is um, we have as comprehensive a set of uh, test cases as possible. So every new feature that's added, we add a, a good set of test cases. Um, and system level tests are very good at capturing unintended consequences. So, and I'll show you on the next slide, unit tests is somewhat limited in that fashion. So, um, you know, as you, as you look at it for a trade-off of how you're going to spend your money on system testing or unit testing, um, there's some benefits to consider for system testing. Um, and, of course, as we make a deliverable, we can say we've got a 100% coverage on our unit tests. Um, that doesn't persuade a customer that it does anything interesting because they don't have an interface definition for the unit, they, they only have an interface defini definition for the system. 
And it's, as I mentioned, then it's not always reasonable or possible even to uh, test everything from the system. So that's when we would go down and say it's worthwhile doing uh, more unit level testing. And generally, then we're saying we can fully automate the system test. So now we look inside our system and say, well, we'll classify a unit then now as, as maybe a subsystem or we'll call it a unit. Um, you know, teams often go down and say, well, let's call a function um, a unit and let's test every function because we'll get the best. Uh, best chance of getting zero bugs if we do that. I think that's kind of flawed approach um, um, in general, primarily because um, functions don't have requirements in general. No one in automotive that I know defines requirements well. I mean, they're hard enough to get at the system level. At a subsystem level, for example, in, um, um, in uh, electronic data recording in an, in, a, in an airbag system, which we worked on not so long ago, um, that had very good requirements from GM, so we call it a subsystem. It has good requirements, we can test to it, but no one really goes down and says, well, here's a function that does ABC and it tests a couple of things. No one wrote that, that uh, set of requirements, so we can't really uh, write test cases to it unless we analyze the code. If we're analyzing the code, then it's part of a review cycle, and that means it's not automatable. So things that we see already in automotive that are subsystems are things like Simulink subsystem blocks would be a subsystem, Autosar components, software components would be a subsystem, and a lot of companies will use Rhapsody as an architecture diagram, and really Rhapsody then, the entities inside Rhapsody would be uh, um, subsystems, and we'd say all those things can be uh, unit tested. Right, I mentioned that bullet there. So. And, it, and now with that classification, we can, we can go forward and say unit tests are automatable, so we're going to uh, set those up also to be uh, part of our automation cycle. So just a couple of things on the unit tests I would em emphasize again. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, suppose we're partitioning our system into very small units um, and say then uh, unit 98 has got test set 98, I modify unit 98 code to add a new feature, I, I, I probably have to modify test set 98 so the, because there's a direct relationship between them. I can run now the tests against the unit. I could do it on my desktop or I could check it in and have it happen automatically, but it could happen just on a single check-in and happen quickly. But there's no point in me rerunning unit tests 1, 2, 3, 97 and 99 because they can't fail because if the test didn't change and the source didn't change, then you get the same outcome, so there's no point in me really running all those ones every time. So there's a kind of a uh, couple of bullets there. One is they don't detect un unintended consequences, uh, especially that the lower I get, the smaller the entity, there's no unintended consequences, which I'm saying is a big benefit to me. And rerunning the full suite, which is really what happens in the automation cycle, if I pick these up and run the whole lot again, well, it's using up cycles that are, could be valuable in running other test cases. One of our customers, their full regression cycle takes two weeks, so part of their problem is um, is uh, deciding which ones they run and trying to optimize that uh, selection process so they run them the highest priority or the most payback ones first without, and, and their only other choice is to replicate the system and get it running on concurrent systems. Uh, and in general then, uh, what I've seen is the smaller the units, the less there are requirements, so it's really difficult to actually um, uh, have testers create test cases without looking at the code, and that's self-defeating. For example, if Unit 98 has no requirements and I'm uh, doing the test cases for it, well, my only choice is to look at Unit 98. Well, in, if I'm looking at it, my tests are all going to pass because so that usually isn't what will happen. So I'll look at unit 97, 98, and 99 and say, here's a little subsystem. I know what 98 is supposed to be doing. Let me just check it's working right. Well, now I have to do some review. And if someone changes unit 97, I need to te check test cases 98 again. And, and so there's a lot of uh, back and forth there. So um, unit testing, start with bigger units and only if you really have to go to small things like uh, testing um, functions. So uh, review then are the things that we do manually. I'll just uh, bring those up there. Um, they're, ver they're very valuable. The things you just have to be concerned with review is uh, discipline to, to get it right. And you know you often put two or three valuable engineers in a room, and uh, and um, and um, 
that's expensive to do as well, so you need uh, to plan that uh, to get that efficient. So here then, we'll say there is a benefit that I can see from the review path. Suppose I pick a, a subset of uh, functions that implement what I'm looking at as a subsystem. I can actually formalize that entity with test cases, test it from its I.O. boundary, and then, if you like, uh, even though there were no requirements, I'm essentially capturing a formal behavior of that with test cases, and then I can promote that up to a unit test, and it becomes a, a definition of the requirements of that subsystem um, by having a formal set of test cases for it. So just a couple of words then on, on coverage. Um, and coverage is often very... Uh, very uh, misused me uh, measurement or metric uh, from a system and um, you know to, to go through the diagram here then we've got requirements and hopefully we've got a good comprehensive set of requirements and we've got some expert test engineers who can pull the requirements and turn them into comprehensive suites of tests. We run our tests uh, on the system and we measure coverage and, uh, and um, you know the coverage measurement, people assume, is telling them something about how complete the tests are and um, and how good the tests are, and you know the metric is often used like that, which is somewhat flawed. And the example is, you know, if I go out to my car, um, the requirement is that it idles at um, 800 RPM. Say, uh, I go out to my car, I start the engine, it idles at 800. I could say that test case is passed. If I instrument to the code and measured coverage, I probably hit 60 or 70 percent of the code. Um, so my coverage measurement would be 70% complete, and I did one test case and ver verified one requirement. So, you, you know, it, it doesn't work to say that coverage is telling you either completeness or quality of the tests. It just tells you that some things have not been touched and you've got some work to do. So, so my view of coverage is, um, is uh, I'll just bring this up here is to say it helps us identify missing requirements because if I go through the first steps, the, um, the developing the tests and run the tests and I miss things, well it meant either one, I don't have requirements for the thing I t uh, for the code that was missed, or two, I don't have test cases from those requirements. And they're really you know, uh, endemic process problems that ought to be fixed and what we usually find is there's a test engineer iterating on the right hand side trying to get the coverage up and the whole process problem is uh, is lost, and uh, or the information is lost, and really that was the important piece to get it fed back into the process. All right, just a couple more slides here then. So we've got test automation. So we've got this system now, an ALM system, which is going to give us a trigger, and uh, essentially the steps are we're going to... Um, we're going to have a definition on uh, the top green box on the left there of the resources we've got uh, that we can run our test cases on. We've got a, a large selection of test cases to run. We're going to uh, select which test cases and we'll drill down on that one uh, shortly. We're going to create a queue. We're going to queue the test cases uh, to the uh, um, uh, test environment and then um, on the test environment or maybe separate from the test environment we're going to extract from our ALM system all the binaries, all the uh, sources to build a binary and now we're ready to run a test, we're going to feed those results back to the system. So really the, most of that is straightforward. The one that we just want to consider in some more detail there is a test case selection. So we've got a test case repository, we've been feeding this thing with test cases you know, for months. Uh, there's many test cases, as I said, some companies then will have two weeks worth of tests if they start them from beginning to end. Um, so if we do all the tests, it ends up being uh, too slow and the feedback cycle is too slow. So we've got to make uh, a selection of what tests we'll run. So um, we'll run the quick tests, the imperative test, which says um, it's got to be able to do this before I give it to anyone. The CAN bus has got to be up and running. We'll do the test from an impact analysis, which is really saying going back to our system um, and saying tell me from what changed, what tests I ought to be um, uh, working on manually queued tests because I know better that this is ought to be added to the queue and then the remaining tests. We don't want to we don't want it to be that because we're starting our test cycle every hour that we never get to the bottom and we never run every test. So so there now we say if if we can implement that queue um, we get to the point where we 
uh, and, and we've defined our test case format, we get to the point where the system now can start churning on these and, and uh, creating test cases and giving us that feedback of whether they're passing or failing in an automated fashion. So I think uh, we'll just uh, put up the final slide here and say, I mean, they're the, they're the takeaway things that I'd leave on the screen and say, um, uh, you know, from my point of view, the important things that ought to be uh, considered as we're uh, considering automated test. Um, any questions from anybody on that? Yep. Yes, I might have missed something, but what about the integration test level? Um, yeah, so my view, I mean, you know, if you if you look at the, the stand, like I think maybe that came from DL 178 standards to say there's integration test, and really um, my view is that uh, there's two steps to that. One is taking things that have never worked together and put them together so they work, um, and that's often a manual process because as soon as you put them together, nothing works, and you start stitching and stitching, and they finally get together and start working. But once they work as a, a system, and we can call that a subsystem, then we say let's let's um, wrap that in test cases and we can verify that subsystem. So I'd still say that's just a, another view of subsystem testing. Subsystem. Yeah, so there's a manual phase to get it from debugging, you know, not working to working, but once it's working, we have, a, we just consider it a subsystem and do testing there. Okay. So this is actually a subsystem testing. Yeah. And another question, if I may, um, you said that you don't have requirements to test the unit Test against. What about a specification? Right. Well, the, 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 I mean, the, the problem I see that if um, I've, I've got high level requirements, which um, can be, uh, you know, we, you can work on it, like saying that, um, um, you know, the indicators ought to flash um, at a, a duty cycle of um, uh, one second. Now, someone could imp implement that a hundred ways, and if the code says, you know, for I equal one to five because I haven't to know the cycle, set it on, else set it off or something, I couldn't derive that test case from the requirement that it has. So I say I can't go directly from that. There's other things I have to analyze to know that that piece of code is right. And so I say, to, if I have to analyze other stuff, then I have to make it manual or every time any of that other stuff changes, I have to go and redo the analysis. So it puts me in a quandary, you know, because if I've got to go and reanalyze code, now it says I can't really just let, rely on the test case to do it for me because I've got to look at all the dependent blocks and go and reanalyze them to know that that one test I wrote was right. Well, I, I see a big potential in automation of unit tests because when you go down to methods where you have a huge set of different parameters to put in, you can actually automate um, the test so that you don't fail. Yes, and I agree with that, but I'd say um, I'd say the the interface, you know, that was talked about um, early on. If if we have uh, a somewhat more complex entity with APIs and interfaces, and we test for the for the interface, then that's the way to go down. But you know, uh, uh, I'd say there's still flawed if you just pick up individual functions and go for functions. But classes or objects or entities would be the way to go, which I think you're saying as well. Well, thank you. Um, I think we're out of time All for right. questions. Yep. We're going to keep kind of on a little bit of a